Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design, and in this video, episode three of our Plasticity Beginner Solid Modeling series, we're going to be talking about patterns. Now, if you missed the first two episodes, we talked about starting shapes, things like primitives, and creating solids from curves. In the second episode, we talked about edges and offsets. Now, it's not required that you have the previous knowledge of those two episodes. We will be covering some of those things again. But as we build through all of these tools in the first four episodes of the series, we're building towards applying them to a model in episode five, where we're going to work on a sci-fi power generation. So what we're going to be doing today is focusing our attention on patterns or repeating geometry. So that way we can make use of something that we made without having to constantly redo it. Now, remember, if you are purchasing Plasticity, we are an affiliate. So if you use the code LEAD10 at checkout, you'll get 10% off either the Indie or Studio license. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I want to do is get rid of this box. And I'm going to start by hitting 7 on my numpad. And I'm going to begin with a regular polygon. Now, as I'm dragging this out, I'm going to hold Shift and scroll my mouse wheel. And then I'm going to snap to the x-axis right click to accept, and I'm gonna pull this up in 3D. Now basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a head of a bolt. I'm gonna hide the polygon and on the bottom side, I'm gonna use a primitive cylinder, begin dragging this out, pull this down, and I'm gonna use Q, which allows me to do a union with another body. Right click, and you can see that I've got a single solid body here. I'm not going to worry about putting threads on this, but we are going to do a little bit of additional cleanup. I'm going to go to a side view, change to my edge selection. I'm going to do a box select through here. And then we're going to pull these in to round them off. So depending on where your selection is, you may need to pull it out for a fillet or in. Right click. And then we'll add a small fillet to the top. Control select and add a small one to the bottom. Not a super detailed bit of hardware, but this is going to do for what we need. We're going to hit tab or the number five on your numbers to get back your all selection. And for right now, I'm going to move this out of the way. The next thing that I want to do is build something. So I'm going to start with a sphere and sort of drag this thing out, right click. And then I'm going to use my isoparam tool, which again is going to be our control and R. We'll hit tab and snap to the center, right click, and then I'm gonna begin pulling this upper section in. Now, really the only thing that I'm doing here is I'm creating some sort of uh, complex shape that I can put this hardware on. The next thing that I'm gonna do is come to the side, use my line tool. We're gonna come in, over, and back out at some angle. B on the keyboard to round those corners off. And then we're going to imprint this with Shift and I. Click that, and then we'll hide that polyline. So we've got a couple of things going on in this model so far. We've built this little sphere. It's got a, an edge here that we're going to use a little bit later, and we built this simple bolt. Now, so far, we haven't really done any sort of array or patterning. So we're going to talk about that right now. The first thing that we want to do is we're going to select the bolt, and notice in the bottom right-hand corner that we've got the option for a rectangular array, we've got the option for a radial array, and then we've got this project on curve that doesn't really help us out too much. So these are the two main array types that pop up. If I select radial array, I need to select the center point, which in this case is going to be our origin, and you can see that it places those all the way around the origin. We can increase or decrease the number here. Uh, we've got this repeat number. You can see that it allows us to repeat that going outward, and that can be pretty handy. However, the number on the inside tends to needs to, it needs to be increased as we begin going out radially away from the source. But this is a great starting point. So right-clicking, we've now got all of these bolts. One thing that we can do while they're all selected is Control and G, or we can click this in the bottom left-hand corner to create a group. And I'm going to right-click, and I'm going to rename that group. We can also double click on it, and I'm just going to say bolt one. The reason this is nice is because we can hide everything in the group all at once, and this allows us to simplify our display a little bit. So that's our first type of array, doing a radial array around something. 
So for now, let's go into this folder. We're going to hide it all, but I'm going to bring back this first one. So in order to do that, we'll need to shift select all of these extrudes, and then we can hide them, or you can use H on the keyboard. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to talk about a linear array. So once we select this, we use a rectangular or linear array. We're going to snap to a line or an edge. So this time we're going to do X. And then we can increase or decrease the number between them. We can also change the repeats. So as we do that, you can see we're be beginning to fill out this pattern. We can pull these manually and kind of give it more space as needed. Or you can give them individual specific numbers between. Right click. And now we've made that second array. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down. All of these are selected with the exception of the first one. I'm going to hold down Control or Command if you're on a Mac to deselect it. And I'm going to add those to a group as well. So group two, we'll double click on it. And I'm just going to say bolt two. So I remember what it is, hide everything. And then we've got that first one still sitting there. So those are two main array types, the rectangular or linear, as I like to call it, and the radial or the circular. It's going to go about an axis. There is another type of array that's curve driven array. Now the curve driven array is pretty handy, especially when you need to go around a complex shape. But first it's gonna require us to place this in a specific location. Now a couple ways that we can do this is we can kind of manually move it around and try to get it close, but there is actually a handy tool. So when we select an object and we use Shift D, what we're doing is we're creating a duplicate of that. If we right click, now I've got a second instance of it. Now, instead of using Shift D, if we use Control D, we can pick the location where we want our snap point, this blue circle. And then as I drag this around, this will allow me to snap it to various locations. You can see right now it's on this face. There is an option F on the keyboard to flip it. And you can see that it's snapping its orientation. What we can do here as we have it in this location we can flip it to X, Y, or Z up. We can also hit A and rotate it around, or we can position it relatively close, right click, and then you can see it's asking me to position another one. I'm gonna hit escape because I don't need to position more, but that's a great way where we can take something like a bolt or hardware and place it on a complex surface. And that can work up here. We're gonna do control D one more time. I'm gonna snap here. I'm gonna hit F to flip its location. And you right click to accept, right click to accept. And you can see that we can quickly and easily sort of place these around, hit escape when we're done. So great way that we can take an object that has a planar face on it and apply it around that circular or curved object. But the main reason that we're here is for that extra type of array. Now it's not gonna pop up down here, so we will need to use see all commands or F on the keyboard. I'm gonna start to type in array and notice that curve array appears. When we use curve array, we need to select a path, and this edge right here, that is not available as a path. Even though it is something that we can select, even if I use my edge selection, it won't let me grab it. So before we do that, we need to select this edge. So what I'm gonna do is hold down Alt on the keyboard, select the edge, and Shift and D to duplicate it. Now, if I hide the sphere, you can see that that curve is there floating in space. So back to my all selection, so I can select that bolt again, F, start to type in array, curve driven array, now I can select that curve. Now the benefit here is it's gonna allow us to place this around a complex shape. Even though we duplicated that curve and there's no geometry there, these should all still be pointing the correct orientation relative to that curve. Essentially, it understands the direction of the curve and where a normal curve would be pointing, in this case, towards the center of our sphere. Right click, and now we've got all of these bolts and hardware placed around it. Now, it's not a perfect solution. You will notice that as we get to these transitions, that it's having a much harder time getting the orientation of the bolt. But for the most part, this is a nice way where we can take a complex shape like this sphere and we can move things like hardware or other features around it by using a curve-driven array. There is one more thing that I do want to talk about, and for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the sphere, and then I want to invert my selection. 
So we're going to use F on the keyboard and start to type in invert. You can see here that Alt A allows me to invert my selection, and I can just hit H on the keyboard. It's going to be a quick way for me to just keep what's in the middle here. So while we've already used Shift D to duplicate and Control D to duplicate with placement, we also have an Alt D. Now Alt D is going to allow us to create an alternate duplicate. Now it doesn't work on every object. So in this case, let's do a box primitive, for example. Let's go ahead and just place this over here and right click to accept. So when I select this object and I do Alt D, nothing happens. However, when I select this object here and do Alt D, a silhouette curve is projected down to that XY plane. So in some cases, you'll get to take whatever the max or the output size of your object is, again, it's, it's more like a silhouette, and project that curve down to that plane. So if we hide this, you can see what we're left with here is essentially the basis for that shape. So again, Shift D, Control D, and Alt D all do something to duplicate the object, but that Alt D is more of an, they're called an alternate duplicate, and it's basically taking a silhouette curve and projecting it down. Now, you might be thinking, what good is an alternate duplicate? And there are some unique applications for it. And let's go ahead and let's just make a complex shape real quick. We're going to go to a top-down view. I'm just going to create something that has sort of an interesting shape. B on the keyboard. I'm going to round all these corners. Right-click. I'm going to pull this up in 3D. And then let's just say for the purposes of this, that that polyline never existed, that we don't know what the base of this is. Well, we may want to make some changes or some variations to this, and the alternate duplicate might be a great way for us to do something like create a pipe at the basis of this. Let's go ahead and make the section size bigger, and we'll use W, which is a difference. We can select the target, and then we can hide our curve. Uh, so what this allows us to do is, unlike a fillet or a chamfer, we can get the silhouette of the basis of our design, and then we can use tools like pipe to cut away that detail on the bottom. Again, its application is going to be limited, but since we're talking about Shift-D and Control-D, which are other duplicates, it's important to understand that there is that third option of Alt-D. It just might give you something that you're not expecting. So there are a couple of extra things that you can do that, that we should probably mention or talk about. So for example, if I am using G to move an object, we've got options for things like freestyle and pivot. Now, what I mean by this is I'm going to do a quick example of putting a hole through the center of this. We're going to pull it down. And let's say that I needed that bolt to be exactly in that hole. Well, if we use G to move this, if we use F for freestyle, we're going to pick the starting point from the object that we want to move and the ending point where we want to put it. So that is a great way to accurately place something like a bolt into a bolt hole location. So make sure that when you are playing around with these options, you think about things like the freestyle move option. This also works for things like rotation. And pivot point allows us to change where that pivot point is. The reason that might be important is more so in line with rotation generally. But for example, if I wanted to move this object, the pivot point is located at the center. If I use V on the keyboard, I can place that pivot point somewhere else. And what this means is if I need to move it in plane relative to something else. So for example, if now I want to use freestyle, um, I can use that that specific point to rotate or move about. Again, it has more of an application when we're talking about rotation, but it does also work for things like move. That's going to be the basis of this video. Mainly, we wanted to talk about patterns for linear array, radial array, and curve-driven array. But remember that we do have options for things like duplicate and the duplicate with placement option, which is control and D. And we also can use tools like freestyle move when we're just simply moving objects around and trying to get them in the right location. Now, I know that this was a lot in a short period of time. Remember that we are building up these tools to use them in our last episode, episode five, where we're gonna go through them in an application. We're gonna be modeling something 
and figuring out where these tools work into that equation. But if you have any questions on what you saw here or the other episodes, please leave a comment. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.